Hi, if you're coming here from the story access game, what's up? You know what's up. But on the off chance you're not, or you clicked the link or put the command into the Twitch chat, this is an explanation for all of the different categories for which how we review gameplay. These are all intended to be pseudo-standardized categories to help prompt ideas and concepts to make sure we don't miss anything when it comes to reviews. These are not um, trying to flatten all games into a single box, but more trying to be a little bit more organized about how we cover them. There's a few more gameplay categories than there are story categories. This might be a longer video than the last one. Nevertheless, I think most of these will be more self-explanatory. I'll just get right into it. All roads lead to Rome. So this is one of the more common gameplay concepts, especially in RPGs. Um, all Roads Lead to Rome is when there's a quest or a section of a quest or a section of a game where you're always going to start here and you're always going to end here, but how exactly you get there is up to you. Uh, this is true for games like Dishonored. This is true for games like Oblivion. This is true for games like Wasteland 3 or Mass Effect 2. All of these games have things where you're always going to end up at a certain point, but there's a lot of malleability in how you get there. I tend to really value this kind of game design, especially since it's a lot more feasible to do than true branching narrative. Animations. Now, we already had animations in story. Animations in gameplay are completely different. Cool and interesting animations have nothing to do with this. Animations are all about how useful they are with regards to gameplay. Usually this is the kind of thing where you can see when an enemy is going to attack where and how based on how they're animated. This can also apply to terrain design, for example, or the nature of how a vehicle or something like that moves in a racer or a fighter sim. Audio spam. This is one of those always negative things. You know what audio spam is because you've probably paid Pokemon. Eh, 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 eh. But even if you haven't, you get the general concept. Alternative leveling mechanics. Uh, that's a kind of a rare one. It doesn't come up all that often, to be completely honest with you, but it is a category we've used several times. The idea is stuff you do to develop and flesh out your character that has nothing to do with your core kit. Um, like Materia in Final Fantasy VII, or the runes in Diablo III, or talents and Diablo 2, stuff like that. That's alternate leveling. Backtracking. This is a fun one. Because backtracking is uh, can be good or bad. Some people don't understand this. Back, bad backtracking is obvious when you're just going back and forth through an area over and over. Good backtracking has to do with when you... Either the nature of how you're moving through it has changed because of addition kit or levels or abilities. Or the nature of the area you're moving through has changed because something you've done elsewhere in the world has changed it. So for all intents and purposes, you're actually going back through the same, a different area, even though it was originally the, diff the same area, stuff like that. So that's backtracking. Bestiary, obvious. It's information in the game to help you to see the information on enemies. And there's a gradient here as there is with all of these. Sometimes it's neat just to have a list. Sometimes it's cool to have like what they drop or what percentages they drop them at. Bosses. Obvious. Good bosses, bad bosses. Bugs. Again, obvious. There are arguably good bugs, but we never give a plus for bugs, so that's another always negative category. Builds. Builds gameplay is a little bit harder to explain than some. Build gameplay is when you have lots of different tools and options and pieces that you can do to make your own unique build. Uh, the... Uh, the, the the game I always love using for this as an example is actually Magic the Gathering, which explains this personally. Even though it's a card game, your deck, that's your build. Because there's hundreds of different ways you can you can design that. Hence the term, the, the ways you can build it. Uh, this is true in a lot of different types of games. Um, the kind of equipment setup you can send, or maybe which talent combos you're using, stuff like that. Build gameplay is really hard to do properly. Because you want a gradient of quality in terms of those builds. So, for example, if in total overall output you have too big of a range from the worst to the best, well, that's a bad thing. But you don't want everything homogenized either, because that's also a bad thing. There should be a worst and there should be a best. You need a sweet spot in the middle here. That's harder to design than it sounds. So, I really value good build design, and it's a lot harder to pull off than it sounds. Built-in cheats. Obvious. Not just cheats, though. The quality of the, the usage of them, or the quality of them and how quality of life they are in usage matters. If you can just hit a button or go into a menu or change something or have access to a console command or something like that, cool. But that's a gradient too. Camera. This one should be pretty obvious for anybody who's played a PS1 or an N64 game. Camera can be good, but is almost always bad. How the camera just gets in the way of playing the freaking game and the whole time you're just like, ah, come on! Why aren't you going... 
you get it. Choices. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I had a bit of a discussion with people on. Choice gameplay, because it is gameplay, is when you are playing a game almost always an RPG, although some other games qualify for this, and a thing pops up at the bottom, and it's like you can choose um, which dialogue option you want to pick for the conversation. That is gameplay. How you progress through quests and interactions and all that is dependent on your choices, and those choices are a gameplay access. So choices gameplay can be good, bad, and in between. Co-op. Obvious. Controls. Again, fairly obvious. Core combat. This is kind of a catch-all category, but it still qualifies because core combat is how interesting the core element of the central gameplay loop as regarding to combat plays. Um, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be fun, it can be terrible. It really boils down to the simple category of fun. Is this fun? Core mechanics. That's the other generic category. All the core stuff that isn't actually related to combat. Uh, maybe it's crafting, maybe it's building up your house, um, maybe it's uh, painting. I don't know. <laughs> Designing your dynasty in Crusader Kings, that kind of a thing. You know, that's core mechanics. Cosmetics. Obvious. A lot of uh, games allow some kind of cosmetic design to varying degrees of quality. Crafting and gathering. We have almost never given positives for that. That's really... We just don't cover a lot of games that really have a lot of crafting. I think that's what that really is. But it's exactly what it sounds like. The quality of the crafting system and the quality of the gathering are related to it. Crashes. So we have a bugs category, but crashes are different. Crashes are worse, and crashes suck. Difficulty curve. Obvious. It doesn't have to be a smooth line necessarily, but you've played plenty of games where the difficulty curve does this, right? Or you run into a cliff. Difficulty options and or mutators. This is exactly what it sounds like. Also, one of the most common <laughs> gameplay negatives we give to virtually every game out there because most games have what I call lazy difficulty, which is when there's a little slider that changes the enemy health and the enemy damage, and that's it. Nevertheless, I do value really good difficulty design, uh, both up and down. Durability. This is thankfully something we don't cover all that often, but it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when durability is either really well designed, like in a survival game, or really badly designed, like in Dying Light 2. Or Zelda. Early game. Early game only applies to certain types of games, uh, notably like 4X games, and most strategy games actually. The early part of the game though, I suppose I should explain this in full. Early game needs to give the player a lot of options, but it also needs to not overwhelm them, and it also needs to not completely screw them over. How many of you have ever heard of the term early game hell? Well, that would qualify for things like RPGs or, hell, even Spiritfarer had this problem. Um, but again, really, really giving the player those kind of options and design, important. Encounter rate. How often do we have to engage in the combat? This is almost always a negative, but not always. There are a few times where the encounter rate is actually a good thing, especially when the option to encounter is on the player's choice, where you can decide your encounter rate. Encounters, so rather encounter design. So I'm going to describe this. This is the first part of the of the trio of enemies. Um, encounter is the specifics of which enemies you are encountering and the nature of where you're encountering it. Uh, a lot of games can vary this up. There's not always necessarily an enemy there. Sometimes it's just a terrain. Sometimes you just need you're, you're fighting a timer, or there's a tidal wave coming, or Maybe there's this slowly advancing bit of lava as the ship is sinking. Stuff like that, right? That's an encounter. Uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be combat. But the most common way it comes in is how the developers have manually and carefully designed which enemies you encounter, in which combination, at which place. So they have a, developers have a lot of tools to make encounters good. It's pretty much the reason Doom, the original Doom, was considered a good game was because of its encounter design. Um, well... There's other reasons, too. But point being, Doom has traditionally been very good about encounter design. Even though they have very very small number of enemies, they use them well, right? We talked about this during Doom 64, for example. So that's encounters. Immediately after that is enemy design. Enemy design is just the design of the enemy themselves. Uh, their attack patterns, uh, their, their abilities, their stats, their weak points, all the stuff that goes into that. Enemy AI. 
this is exactly what it sounds like. If you've ever fought someone who's just running into a wall or smashing their face against the crate that you're standing on, you've seen bad enemy AI. But if you've ever seen an enemy AI really outthink and outmaneuver and, and intelligently use the terrain or whatever against you, that's good enemy AI. And finally, enemy variety. I forgot these were all in one bundle. Uh, enemy variety is exactly what it sounds like. And you can see how these are three separate categories, technically four separate categories. The enemy design is the design of the individual enemy. The enemy variety is how many variant enemies there are. The encounter is how they're used. And the enemy AI is how well the computer uses them against you. Quick thing, though. Enemy variety, uh, a lot of people mistake this. They think that it just means, oh, there's like 15 enemies in the game, or like 30 enemies in the game. Therefore, it has good enemy variety. But if those 30 enemies are all melee people who walk up and hit you with the exact same type of attacks, then the actual enemy variety is one. Enemy variety has to do, on the gameplay axis, has to do with the nature of how they attack and what they do and their tactics and their weakness and all that fun stuff. In other words, you have to have multiple enemy designs, not just reskins or things that functionally use the same general types of attacks. End game and post game. Obvious. Fast travel. So fast travel is a bit of an interesting one. There's a big difference between good fast travel and bad fast travel, but what it really boils down to is... Do you have the option to uh, find your fast travel as you go? How much options do you have of setting your own fast travel, like Mark and Recall in Morrowind? Or uh, how many restrictions are upon you for using it, and where, and when? And all that kind of stuff goes into good fast travel design. Gotcha! No, not G-A-C-H-A. G-O-T-C-H-A. Thankfully, this is the kind of thing we don't see as much in more modern games, but gotcha is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the game just kind of has a surprise, screw you moment. Any, anybody who's played an NES platformer knows exactly what gotcha means. Uh, graphics usage. This is kind of a weird one, because it has to do with uh, not the quality of the graphics on any level, that almost always sits on the narrative axis, uh, but rather how the graphics are used, uh, either in, in order to infer gameplay design or, much more likely, how much headache, how headache inducing it is. If you ever get had a game that has aggressive depth of blur, or excuse me, depth of field where the backgrounds are all blurred out, or if you ever played a game where there's this really horrible motion blur that you can't turn off, stuff like that. Maybe there's a stuttering, maybe it has a really bad frame rate. Maybe there's a flickering that goes on. The kind of stuff that tends to be physically painful because they're misusing things. That's bad graphics. Grind and leveling. Should be obvious, but in case you've never heard me say this. Grind is when you don't enjoy a repetitive task. Leveling is when you do. So this can be both a positive and a negative. And it doesn't have to be experience for levels. This can, this can apply to all kinds of things. Like survival games have you grinding crafting materials. Um, and like a lot of management sims has you grinding money in order to be able to build new stuff. Stuff like that. Guidance and flow of exploration. This is important in a lot of games and undervalued in even more. It's how much the game does to incline you on what to do where to do it, and how to do it. And I don't want to be led around by the nose, but I also don't want to go in completely blind. Once again, this is one of those sweet spot kind of things. I want there to be guidance, not direction. Um, a recent example. In Grand Theft Auto V, there's this one quest where you're put in a spot, and it wants you to do this other quest next. You don't have to, but it wants you to. So it ensures that the, your ride will be right next door when you get, when when you finish this specific quest. Once you turn to the quest, you get into the ride. As you do it, the camera will naturally swivel over, and you'll see what's happening over there, which is the next quest they want you to do. And thus, you're automatically like just by nature of how they laid out the 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 format and the, the positioning of the cars and the positioning of the new quest, you've got a bit of guidance there. Also, Metroidvanias live and breathe on good guidance design. So. Hubs and towns. So this is purely from a gameplay perspective, not a narrative one. Uh, narratively, hubs can be all super cool and awesome, but gameplay-wise, we want things to be efficient. We want things to be well-designed in terms of layout. I don't want to go all the way across town to interact with someone I'm going to interact with all the time, like a repair vendor or a, a skilled person, and then have to trudge all the way back over here in order to go and interact with my bank and get some items to go all the way up here to go to my crafting thing, and so forth and so on. That's good town design. Or hub design, because that applies to like your ship in Mass Effect, or your camp in Baldur's Gate 3, stuff like that. HUD. No, with a D. D is a dog this time. HUD design is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's the heads-up display. 
your health, your, your mini map, all that kind of stuff. Unobtrusive, but also informative and also good color design. HUD design is actually really, really, really tricky stuff. I, I really value a good HUD. So that's that. Hyperbeam or hyperfail moment. This is named after Super Metroid. I wish I could take credit for that, but I absolutely cannot. Um, because credit for that goes to, and I wrote it down just so I could give proper credit here. Uh, Eclectic Oak came up with this term. Hyperbeam moment is when the game just set, gives you something to allow you to be awesome for a little bit. It's almost always a form of catharsis. When you get the super gravity gun in Half-Life 2, for example. Or the eponymous hyperbeam hyper in Super Metroid. But a hyperfail moment is a moment where it's designed to be like that and fails miserably. And the result is it actually feels worse than if they hadn't done it at all. Info in game. This is actually really easy to explain, but it's funny because this one comes up a lot. It's how much of the information is in the freaking game. If I have to go to a wiki, or pull up a walkthrough, or a magazine, or a strategy guide, then that's info that isn't in the game. I value info being in the game so I can actually tell what the hell's happening and make informed decisions about it. Integration and segregation. Gameplay integration, gameplay segregation. Um... It has to do with how the story and the gameplay interact with each other to value and benefit both. Pretty rare, all things considered, but the kind of thing I very value, and generally, both sides get that positive or negative. Interface. Interface is more about the interaction with the game, um, your controls, you ha how many clicks you have to do. Uh, Cross-referencing is a really, really important thing. You know, like, if I have to go through a, three menus to go over here to see, okay, this is what my current stats are, and then I have to go through three back through the three menus and then go two menus over here in order to go see what my current equipment is, and, you know, that's bad interface design. If, by contrast, I could pull up my equipment and see my, my new, my new, you know, my gun, and I'm like, aha! And I could just see the direct stats in a tooltip comparison thing. That's good interface design. Intro. I already talked about this in the other video, but to repeat myself, I'm very, very harsh about intros and outros on both story and gameplay. There needs to be a really good intro to hook the player, and a really good outro to stick the landing so that it's what the player remembers most after the end of the game. How long an intro is varies wildly, but it needs to be good nonetheless. A good intro almost always has um, good hooks, uh, good tutorialization gets you into the, the general gist of what's going to happen. Another thing that tends to be common, excuse me, uncommon, is what's called a taste of power, where you get a bit of a vibe on exactly how the end game is going to go, so you get an idea of where you're going to be eventually before you get knocked back down to level 1. Itemization and inventory design. Inventory design doesn't come up very often because most games don't even have inventory design, unless you're playing Resident Evil 4. But itemization is exactly what it sounds like. What items are where and what they do. It, that's it. Kit. This is one of the most catch-all things we have. Kit is all the stuff at your disposal to play the game. Your weapons in Mega Man, your classes in Dragon Age, your talents in specs, stuff like that. All of that is kit. It's all the things that you have available to, to as a vehicle for playing the game. Good kit design is fantastic. Bad kit design sucks. Late game. So we already talked about early game. Late game is the thing most games screw up. It's when you've gotten to the to the point of the you know you've already finished the early game, you've already had the steam rolling of the mid game, which I'll talk about in a minute. But now you're in the late game, so now it's really easy for the game to become boring because you've already done it all and there's no new mechanics. So now what? A good game will have really good late game design. It'll have new mechanics, new gimmicks, new quests, new interface stuff, new things to do. Like, say, um, the Crises in Stellaris is a good example. A bad game, a uh, bad late game, will have nothing. So you're just spinning your wheels until you're either bored or you finally finish the game. So this is kind of a, it's under, I have launch, but it's launch and microtransactions and DRM. This should be obvious. Uh, this is something we debated for a very, very long time. Games that have a particularly bad launch, we notate that, and we give it negatives, even if they have since patched that up. No Man's Sky, Diablo 3, uh, Cyberpunk 2077, all these games had crap launches, and we decided to notate that in the review and ding the games for that, because even though they have patched those games, they still launched in an unacceptable condition. Microtransactions are obvious, and again, can be a gradient from irritating to frustrating to absolutely intrusive. And dear... Oh, excuse me, DRM is exactly the same thing. We don't encounter that that often, but every now and again there's a game that just has really frustrating DRM. Like the always online thing for Diablo 3. 
Levels and stages. Obvious. You're going through 3-1. Boom. There's a level. Level scaling. This comes up very infrequently and is almost always bad. But how well the game does scaling to you or and the specifics of how it does it. Lighting design. This is, again, from a gameplay perspective. So lighting design is all about how well the game uses the lighting to inform the player of what they need to know. Either because it's well lit, so you can tell what you're doing, or because it's specifically lit, because it only wants you to know certain things unless you seek them out. Lives and penalty for failure. So this is primarily its own category. Uh, lives is obvious. If you've played a Mario game, you know what lives is. But penalty for failure is present in most games. The actual industry term is called uh, friction, player friction. The idea here is there needs to be some kind of detriment for failure, thus the penalty for failure. Good penalty for failure design is actually extraordinarily hard to do, though. It's one of the reasons I value it. Because you want there to be a penalty, but you don't want it to be too hard, but you also don't want it to be too little. If, there, if it's too hard, then it's just frustrating, and if it's too little, then it's pointless. So again, I feel like I'm saying that a lot today. It's a nice sweet spot thing. Log. Uh, log is kind of a weird one. It only applies for very specific types of games. It's when the game has a log that you can go and check to see what the hell actually happened. In some games, there really should be a log, and there freaking isn't. If you've ever had a moment where you're like, uh-huh, and you legitimately don't actually know what happened, that's a good example of that. Map. Obvious. From a gameplay perspective, a map needs to be useful, informative, helpful, Visually distinctive, the kind of thing where you can look at it and parse it, and it's helpful for you to navigate and figure out what you're doing. Oblivion has a good map, Skyrim does not, from a gameplay axis. Minimap, same general concept. Minimap design is very similar to map design, but there's a big gap between a minimap which is merely there versus a minimap which is awesome. Metroid Dread has one of the best minimaps I've ever seen, for example. Mid game, so I already told you early game, I already told you late game. Mid-game is almost always a logical progression of early game. You have all these tools in early game, but by the time you get to mid-game, you should be using all of them. Mid-game is usually considered the meat of these type of games. and You really know what you're doing, and you're actually engaging with the game at the level that they want you to do so. This is especially true when it comes to strategy games, uh, like Civilization or Stellaris or Europa Universalis 4 or whatever. Mid-game is usually better than the other two, but it's also substantially easier to screw up. So we're pretty harsh about that one as well. Mid-mission checkpointing. Obvious. This is how they do autosaves or checkpoints in between levels or checkpoints in between bosses. That kind of thing. Mini games or optional modes. That covers a huge gamut of categories. Um, skirmish mode stuff or optional hard modes or optional speedrun modes. All that kind of stuff sits under that other category. Or even just plain old mini games like in an RPG or whatever. MSQ, I feel like I just explained this. MSQ is a term from Final Fantasy XIV. It stands for Main Story Quest. This is the quality of the main mandatory content as defined by the developers that they think is what is required to beat the game and how good it is from a gameplay perspective. Mod support. So mod support is actually four separate categories in one, but it all just kind of goes under mods because it's all mods. I shouldn't have to explain why mod support is good, but it's worth noting that mod support is also very hard. There's a reason why most developers don't do it. It's a whole thing, right? It helps if you've designed your game from the ground up to be very modular, like Blizzard used to do, and like, say, RimWorld does, for a more modern example. Also, Elder Scrolls. Um, so the, those categories are mods at all, like do mods exist? Is there mod support from the developers? Um, the ease of implementing those mods, the depth and quality of how much you can mod it, and finally, how much the tools the developers have given to you in order to mod the game in question. And I don't think I've, I can think of any game that does all four of these perfectly. But a lot you can see why we divided it into four categories. Because a bunch of games r really champion this one or this one or this one or this one. Or maybe two or, the, or three. But not all of them. Music. This was a long debate back in the day. We've talked about music direction. How music adds to a scene. But music is primarily, in my opinion, and the opinion of the show, a vehicle of gameplay. It's, you're playing a Mega Man level and you're listening to a banging tune going, da -da 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 -da, or a Sonic game, or whatever. You know what I'm talking about. You're playing Devil May Cry and you feel awesome when the, when the music really ramps up in the background because it's part of the gameplay at that point. It's part of your vehicle of actually going through the game and enjoying that aspect of it. New Game Plus. 
obvious. You probably know what that is, but on the off chance you don't, it's when you get to carry forward some of your uh, character or your items or your research or your, your unlocks or whatever into a new playthrough. This can be done well or badly, depending on how much it's forced upon you and how much you get to carry forward. Options. Obvious. When you hit escape and go to the options menu, that's your options. Um, there's a lot of options we consider to be default that don't get credit. But a game that has really, really good options or a near total absence of options when it should have them, that's the kind of thing that'll go there. Outro. Just talked about this. Outro is the end part of the game. Uh, usually in most games, it's the final dungeon, final boss. That's from a gameplay perspective. Really need to stick that outro. Most games don't. Overworld design. Uh, this actually applies to a lot of different types of games. Uh, Metroidvanias, uh, Zeldas, and of course most open world games. Uh, but also RPGs that have an overworld. The overworld design, there's a lot that goes into designing an overworld, which I cannot possibly summarize here. But it has to do with what is placed where, and what directions are and, and design is to it, and the density of it, all that kind of stuff. Because I know you know what I'm talking about when I say that some open worlds are nice, big, open nothings, but then some are very dense, excellently designed areas. Big difference. Pacing. Uh, oh, excuse me. No, no pacing. Padding. Padding and seconds in minutes. So padding is obvious. Padding is bad. But seconds in minutes. <laughs> you know what seconds in minutes is, even if you've never heard of it before. Uh, it's a concept that I think I kind of put the term for. It's the idea of when there's a bunch of little delays in something you do regularly enough that it adds up over time. The example I always like to use is if every time you go to loot something, there's this moment where you go down and then loot something and you loot something like like several times every minute, then those seconds in those minutes add up to hours. And it's a form of dragging a game's length out without actually adding anything, adding anything in return. And that's the important part. It has to be something that is just detrimental, that just drags the experience on. Uh, party AI or auto battle. Obvious. We already talked about enemy AI. Party AI is uh, either how good your party member's AI is or how much control you have over it. Power progression curve. This doesn't come up a lot, but it has to do with how good your curve of overall power increase goes throughout the course of the game. Primary optional. So we already talked about MSQ. That's mandatory content. Primary optional is the meat content that is optional. The kind of stuff that you don't need to do to beat the game, but honestly, the game expects you to do because it's main content, even if it's not mandatory. Princess Peach sections. This comes up semi-frequently. It's when you have a section where you play something completely different. Usually different uh, tool set or different abilities or a, even a completely different mechanism of gameplay. That's a Princess Peach section. If you're playing a side-scrolling platformer and suddenly go to a top-down shoot-em-up, you know what a Princess Peach section is. Quality of life features. Kind of a catch-all, but obvious. There's a lot of things that just make a game more smooth, more enjoyable. Removing the rocks in the shoe kind of a situation. Replayability. We talk about this one all the time. Um, We're actually really defined with replay because there's three replayability positives. The third one is for the bonkers games. These are games that are built around replayability. Roguelikes and strategy games being the big ones. Uh, Civilization VI or Crusader Kings III are designed to be replayed over and over and over. The second replay positive is for games that have mechanisms or gameplay in place to encourage a repeat playthrough, either through New Game Plus or alternate quests or different builds or whatever. The first replay positive, however, is the ephemeral one. It doesn't really have a definition other than, is this game a game that's fun to replay? And that's all the definition is for that first one. Railroading and Invisible Walls. Obvious. Raspberry Jam, or Beetle Leaps. Uh, I've heard this one before. But Raspberry Jam is when the game tries does something to limit your ability to tell what the hell you're doing because you're low on health. So named, I didn't come up with this term. <laughs> Although, Spaceball certainly references this a lot. The idea is, if you've ever played a Call of Duty game where the screen just gets red in blood, as if someone just kind of smashed Raspberry Jam all over the screen, that's that. Respec. Uh, so respecing is actually a big and contentious topic, but it boils down to how many options you have to redesign your character within the course of a game without having to restart the game from scratch. This can be good, bad, and in between. It's a very gradient category, so we always play, put that a little bit case by case. 
Save design. This is also obvious. How So I tend to value fully free save design. Uh, Half-Life 1 is actually one of my favorite examples of this. You can do... There's auto saves. There's manual saves. There's quick saves. There's quick loads. And then there's loading all the other things. That's, that's pretty much ideal save. That's a triple positive save system right there. However, not every game is built that way. And some games encourage you to very much limit your saves. Or maybe you can only save at certain times because of certain things that make sense for how they want you to suffer consequence for things. You get the idea. So that's not a guaranteed thing. However, if you're a game that limits me to only one save slot without a really good reason for it, that's probably a negative. Secondary content. We've already talked about MSQ and Prime Opt. Secondary is the last content. It's, it's the other little side stuff you can do on the side. It can be good, it can be bad, it can be in between. It's usually just secondary quests and RPGs, that kind of a thing. Songs. This is a brand new category we just added a few weeks ago. An individual song that's just really, really, really good and has to really nail it. The very vague definition I have in my mind, and I'm still actually auditing this into the existing reviews, is that if I have to listen to a song for more than 10 seconds to decide if it, and, and, and I haven't already decided if it counts, then it doesn't. Sound design. Very important from, from a game perspective. Um, most people don't even think about sound design from a gameplay perspective, but being able to hear when you hit or what type of hit you've done. Uh, I'm currently playing through Dragon's Dogma. If I hit an enemy and it's doing damage, it gives a sound effect. If I'm hitting them and it's just hitting their armor, it does another sound effect. If I'm hitting them in a non-weak spot, it gives a third sound effect. All of these are distinct uh, sound effects and sound design, and I hope you can't hear the fire alarm going. If it's okay, it's okay. It's just cooking. It's just cooking. Don't worry about it. Strategic layer. This is obvious. Uh, some games have a tactical layer and a strategic layer, so we judge the strategic layer separate for that. Starting options. Um, this is a really specific kind of thing uh, for RPGs. What options you have for building your character initially. For strategy games, what options you have for your initial country. That kind of a thing. Terrain design. This is a tricky one because this applies to a lot of different games. Platformers, uh, strategy games, and... Um, bunch of other stuff like that. It's the kind of thing that uh, works for really, really, really thinking about the layout of the level, the specifics of the, the, the height and the terrain, and there's water over here, and there's a fence over here, and there's a building over here, and there's a, there's a light down here pointing in this direction. That's terrain design, right? Uh, trash design. This kind of has to do with encounter rate, but some games have a concept of just trash, like the Dynasty Warrior games. That can be fun, where you're just smashing through everything, or boring, where you're just smashing through everything. I know the distinction is hard to see. Trash design. Uh, traversal mechanics. This is really, really, really important in a lot of games, especially as open world games uh, tend to be more prolific with this, because traversal design is how fun is it to go from point A to point B. Um, really cool, interesting cars, or driving mechanics, or being able to swing around as Spider-Man. Stuff like that. That's traversal design. If there's bad traversal design, it's when you're just doing this for like 10 minutes at a time, you know, and that's this, this is just your life, just. Tutorialization, obvious. How well does the game tutorialize you? There's a few things I tend to really get irritated by when it comes to tutorialization, not the least of which being when the game not only grabs you and forces you by the nose to be, to do something, but also refuses to let you do anything other than what it's trying to tell you to do. I tend to value tutorialization in-game. Uh, Super Mario World is actually my er example of this, because that game is the best tutorialized game I've ever played, where simply by playing the game and playing the levels, you will learn how to play that game, because the level design is entirely designed around teaching you how to play it. Proviso. Some games are so complicated, a lot of the larger strategy games, for example, that you kind of need that kind of giant wall of text tutorials. That's fine. It's case by case. Unintentionally skippable content. Have you ever played a game where you're in the middle of a dialogue and, whoops, it accidentally skipped the dialogue because you, you didn't mean to, but you walked five feet further than you meant to? Or a game where quests or content or cutscenes are just gone because you didn't actually get it when you were supposed to? That's over uh, unintentionally skippable content. Hem. I'm almost done, I swear to God. Unskippable cutscenes. They're exactly what they sound like. It's any time where you don't have the option to skip a cutscene. More common in older games than more modern ones, but you still see some modern games that have this. Some people say they're not bothered by this. I am. 
Uh, every time I hear someone's like, well, if, if you, you, you like the cutscenes, why skip them? Well, all you have to do is understand a, diff a, a long cutscene before a difficult boss fight to understand why I prefer to have cutscenes be skippable. Viscerality. This is actually a three-pronged thing. How, how much visual feedback is there for what you do in the game? How much audio feedback is what we do in the game? And how much does it actually have an impact? I need to look cool. I need to sound cool. I need to feel cool. Viscerality is actually really important in game design, especially games like FPSs or a lot of RPGs or action, like action, uh, I guess it's just action games, like fighting games, for example. So that's viscerality. Visual continuity. If I can just, without using a map and without using a guide or a quest arrow, navigate through a world simply by the nature of how the world's designed, that's good visual continuity. Um, usually this goes down to landmark design, you know, having something that you can always see. Okay, that's over there, so I can orient myself based on that. That's visual continuity. Visual distinction. How well can I tell what I'm looking at? This is almost always down to color choice, but there's also usage of outlines or hovers or toggles or highlights, that kind of a thing. Walk through itis. If you ever feel the need to go and look up on Google or a strategy guide or whatever to figure out what the hell you're supposed to do next, that's walk through itis. And finally, Yoshi Drums. Yoshi Drums, so named by Nintendo, thanks again for that, is when the music dynamically changes based on what you're doing in the game, thus making the music even more awesome than it otherwise was. Whew. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion on gameplay design. I'll see you next time.